Without further ado, let me now introduce today's speaker, Dr. Angela Flack. Angela joined Edinburgh Instruments as an application scientist in 2019. And prior to this, she studied chemistry at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow before undertaking a PhD at the University of Reims in France. Her doctorate focused on the identification of microorganisms using vibrational spectroscopy. At Edinburgh Instruments, Angela is responsible for the investigation of new applications and the development of our RM5 and RMS1000 Raman microscopes. I hope everyone enjoys the presentation and over to you, Angela. Thanks for that introduction, Stuart, and hello to everybody who's tuned in today. As mentioned today, I'll be giving a webinar starting with an introduction to Raman microscopy and then talking through some of its applications. Firstly, I'll give a brief introduction to Edinburgh Instruments in case anybody isn't too familiar. So, as is no surprise, we're based in Scotland near Edinburgh and we have over 40 years in the scientific instrumentation market. We were founded in 1971 and last year we started to launch our Raman spectrometers, of which we now offer two. We also have instruments for steady state photoluminescence, photoluminescence lifetimes, UV absorption, transient absorption, and like I just said, Raman microscopy. Almost all of our instruments go out the door specially configured to the customer's needs, and this makes our instruments highly flexible to fit around your sample type. So today I will start with an introduction to Raman microscopy. So firstly, I'll introduce Raman spectroscopy and how that works as a technique before discussing how it can be coupled with a confocal microscope to create confocal Raman microscopy. And then I'll give an introduction to both of our Raman instruments, which are both confocal Raman microscopes. We have the RM5, which we launched last year, and the RMS1000, which is freshly launched this month. I'll then move on to some applications. Firstly, food security, then surface enhanced Raman scattering, a brief discussion on pharmaceuticals before finishing on a graphene example. So what is Raman spectroscopy and how does it work? In Raman spectroscopy, a monochromatic laser is first focused onto the sample. After the sample molecules are excited, light is scattered. And this is either Rayleigh scattering or Raman scattering. Rayleigh scattering has no net energy difference and therefore it's not of any use to us for looking into our sample. The Raman scattering can either be Stokes or anti-Stokes Raman scattering, but I'll discuss this more in a bit. So next our light is directed onto a filter and this filter is to remove the Rayleigh scattering that isn't of interest to us. We use either notch or edge filters to remove it. And then the Raman scatter is directed onto a diffraction grating. The grating splits the light into its constituent wavelengths. And this is then focused onto a detector. So this is the energy diagram for the three types of scattering that can occur. As mentioned with Rayleigh scattering, there is no net energy difference. In Stokes and anti-Stokes, Raman scattering, both of these provide us with Raman information. However, Stokes is much more likely to, observe, to be observed and is therefore the more commonly used technique out of the two. And this is because for anti-Stokes, you have to start in an already excited state, which naturally is just much, much less likely that your sample will be in this state. So the energy difference is then converted into wave numbers, and this is referred to as the Raman shift. And it's plotted against counts to give us our Raman spectrum. Now Raman spectroscopy is an inherently weak scattering event. And compared to Rayleigh scattering, it only occurs in one in a million times. So sometimes we might need to look at ways to enhance our Raman spectra. And there's two ways we can do this, which require no modification as such to the Raman spectrometer itself. We have resonance Raman and surface enhanced Raman scattering. 
So firstly, resonance ramming is a technique where the laser excitation frequency is chosen to be close to the frequency of an electronic transition. Typically, we see enhancements of 10 to the 2 to 10 to the 6 and an improvement in signal to noise. One drawback, however, of resonance Raman is the increased fluorescence that can swamp a Raman signal. When you match the laser to an absorption band, absorption will occur, meaning there is a high chance of fluorescence completely obscuring the Raman peaks. This interference is one of the biggest limits for the use of resonance Raman in the field today. However, we can get around this a little bit by using pre-resonance, and this is drawn in this image here. So in pre-resonance Raman, we use an excitation about 100 wave numbers below the electronic transition. Here we'll still get some enhancement, however, Fortunately, we will also see less risk of fluorescence swamping the sample. Another enhancement technique which is used very frequently is surface enhanced Raman scattering. And this is an enhancement technique where molecules are absorbed onto a rough metal surface. This rough metal surface also has an advantage of it quenching fluorescence, which is great as that's such a common issue with Raman spectroscopy. Enhancements I've said here are 10 to the 6, as that's just what you would always expect. But with the right SIR substrate and sample, you can get enhancements of up to 10 to the 15 even. And with SIRs, you can even have single molecules analyzed by Raman spectroscopy. The exact mechanisms of the SIRs effect are still under debate. However, it's accepted that both electromagnetic enhancement and chemical enhancement play a role. Electromagnetic enhancement has a much more significant effect and it originates from the local field enhancement and the re-radiation enhancement. Chemical enhancement has a much lesser effect and is molecule dependent. So it arises due to the interaction of the molecule with the substrate causing a modification of the polarizability of the molecule. Typically, gold and silver are the two most commonly used nanoparticles for SERs. Additionally, resonance Raman and SERs can be combined to create surface enhanced resonance Raman scattering. So this additional enhancement means that not only do we get the enhancement from resonance Raman and SERs, but we also see the reduced quenched fluorescence that the SERS substrate offers. So this is a great way to use resonance Raman without having the issue of fluorescence. Another technique that could be used to see more of your sample is polarized Raman, polarized Raman spectroscopy. So some molecules, their normal Raman spectra can be enhanced by using different polarization of the excitation light. Raman spectroscopy under standard conditions will tell us about the chemical composition of a sample, but polarized Raman spectroscopy can provide more, even more information such as the symmetry of vibrational modes and the orientation of the sample. So the sample can be isotropic here like cyclohexane, which means it's randomly orientated, so commonly in samples such as liquids. And this is the spectra up here of the cyclohexane. Raman scattered light comprises of a combination of light with a polarization parallel to that of the excitation light and with a polarization perpendicular to it. During a standard Raman measurement, both of these components are measured in the spectrum. However, during polarized Raman measurements, Polarizing filters are used to measure the Raman spectra of each component separately. So in the cyclohexane spectrum shown on the top right here, it's seen that vibrational modes, which are totally symmetric, show the largest variations in intensity between parallel and perpendicular configurations. The other sample type is anisotropic samples. And here, these are directionally orientated samples, such as crystals and polymers. This example is of lithium neobate. So these 
samples, the molecules are fixed are in fixed positions. So this means that the bonds within them can be moved into specific alignment with regard to the excitation polarization. The Raman peaks and their intensities vary depending on this alignment. So as you can see, you get resulting spectra that are quite different. It can be seen that the modes present as well as their intensities and peak positions vary between the spectra and the orientation. So by comparing the information on the polarized spectra from an anzeotropic sample, we can identify the material, its crystal structure and orientation. So now I want to talk about when we couple Raman spectroscopy to a confocal microscope. So in a normal non-confocal microscope, light oriented orientating from outside of the focal plane of the objective can be delivered to the detector. So this results in an uncertainty as to where the light is actually coming from and it decreases the spatial resolution. In a confocal system, a pinhole is included before the light reaches the detector. Placing this pinhole in front of the detector means that only the light from the center of the objective focus can reach the detector and rays originating from outside of the focal plane cannot. So this means we have much greater spatial resolution. So here we see a map of some polymer beads using a pinhole with 100 microns and a pinhole that's 25 microns. And you can see the greatly increased spatial resolution. And having an adjustable pinhole is great for user control to decide what level of spatial resolution they want compared to how much RAM and throughput they might need. So here as well, we now have the ability to do, have some Z resolution, which is typically in the order of one micron. This is because the pinhole acts as a spatial filter in the Z by blocking the RAM and scatter from above and below the focal plane. By having a smaller pinhole, you can get increased spatial resolution, increased image contrast, and you also get decreased fluorescence, which again is great for Raman spectroscopy. All the instruments at Edinburgh Instruments are truly confocal, so this means we have a physical pinhole, whereas you'll see the term pseudo confocal thrown around, and this is where it, the effect of a pinhole is simulated using the orthogonal arrangement of the entrance slit to the spectrograph and the pixels on the CCD camera. If you want the best resolution, you do need a truly confocal setup. Here's a very broad overview design of a Raman spectrometer and the different parts that you need to consider when you're designing the right instrument for you. So we have the laser, and your laser wavelength will typically be dictated by what sort of sample you're looking at. As you go to longer wavelengths, you get less RAM and throughput, but you also get less fluorescence. So a decision needs to be made based on the sample as to whether you need less fluorescence or if you can use a visible or UV laser. We have the entrance slip, which dictates how much light will go through to the confocal pinhole, which I've already discussed. And we have diffraction gratings, which again will depend on what spectral resolution you want and what laser you're using. And finally, to point out, we have the spectrograph. And as I'll mention briefly next, we have two spectrographs on one of our instruments here. And basically you have a standard resolution spectrograph and then you have a high resolution, longer spectrograph. And when you use a longer spectrograph, it means you get increased spectral resolution. The CCD camera is your detector and which detector you choose, again, is mostly detected, determined by your laser. So if you're using anything above 830 nanometers, the CCD will no longer be efficient and you'll want to move to an in-gas detector. So why would we want to do Raman spectroscopy in the first place? It's a very rapid technique. 
and you get a spectrum really, really quickly. And then this spectrum is often referred to as a chemical fingerprint. And this is because the level of information that you obtain from your Raman spectrum is so detailed. It's relatively simple to use. You need a tiny amount of sample. There's no issues with water which is great if you're looking at biological samples, and this is an issue seen in other spectroscopic techniques. There's minimal to no sample preparation because we don't need any tags or dyes, and it's non-destructive and non-contact. So great to keep your sample intact for its end purpose or for a few more analysis. So I'll quickly go through the two instruments that we offer here. First of all, we have the RM5. This was launched last year and is a benchtop research grade instrument. It can have up to three integrated lasers and two detectors. There's a five position Grayson turret, a four position Raman filter turret. And as mentioned, it's a truly confocal system and it works with our Ramical software. Our Ramical software makes everything as automated as possible meaning it's very user-friendly and very simple as most things are just determined by a simple click of a button without any more user interaction. The new RMS 1000 was launched this month and this is a bigger Raman instrument, which is a highly flexible research grade Raman microscope. This time we can have up to five integrated lasers with additional external ports for more lasers you can have two spectrographs, so the standard spectrograph and the longer spectrograph, and up to four detectors. Additionally, the RMS-1000 is compatible with photoluminescence microscopy, time resolve measurements, and fluorescence and lifetime imaging. This slide briefly gives you some of the examples of the unique features of the RMS-1000. So, First of all, this is two spectra from two different amino acids, and we can see the increased spectral resolution when we move to the longer spectrograph. In the middle, we see the white light image of a Scottish banknote, which contains two security dyes. This is the photoluminescence spectra of each of these dyes, and we can create a PL map very simply on the Raman microscope to distinguish between the two dyes. Finally, I'll talk about FLIM. And here, a fluorescence lifetime image can be created using the scan stage mapping facility that comes with the RMS 1000. Instead of a Raman spectrum, a fluorescence lifetime measurement is obtained for every point of the image. The picture shown here is a flim image of a stained pine tree section superimposed onto the bright field image. Now Raman spectroscopy has been used in almost every single application possible. So I am not gonna bore you all by talking you through each section. However, what I would like to know is what sort of samples you are working on or that you are interested in. So I've just put up a poll on the screen and it would be great if you could click what sort of samples you're looking at, what's the most interesting samples to you. And this would be useful for us so that we can in future direct our webinars into a more specific field of interest to the group. So I'll give you a few seconds to answer this. That's great. So we look like we have quite a mixed group here. So materials has just got the most popular vote, but it's very closely followed by pharmaceutical and biological applications. 
So the first example I want to discuss with you today is food security, specifically edible oils. So oils such as olive oil, um, extra virgin olive oil, vegetable oil, and they're obviously one of the main components in our diet. But a common issue with these oils is the adulteration of, for example, extra virgin olive oil with a cheaper oil. Now, obviously, this has the issue commercially of a customer being sold a product that isn't legitimate. However, there's also a risk of health implications. In Spain in 1981, fraudulent oil was sold, causing a new condition termed toxic oil syndrome. In the beginning few months, whilst they were trying to figure out what was going on, over 20,000 people were affected and 300 people died. It was later determined to be caused by contaminated rapeseed oil, which was, which was intended for industrial use, being sold by vendors as olive oil. In this case, the RMS 1000 was fitted with a cuvette holder. In here, we have a times 10 objective and the laser light is focused onto your cuvette. So it's super easy um, for the user. And I use a 785 nanometer excitation. And this was because one of the oils was colored as it was chili oil. So using a visible laser, I got too much black background fluorescence. So it was easy enough for me to just move to the 785 excitation. So here we see a typical spectrum of oil, in this case, olive oil. And generally a Raman spectrum can be split into two sections. So here we have the high wave number region and here we have the fingerprint region. And these are terms that are for all samples, not just in this case. And also for most samples, again, the fingerprint region is the region of interest. So as you can see, there's more peaks here, they're better defined. So there's just more going on for when you're trying to get some level of identification from your sample. So the six oils I looked at were chili oil, extra virgin olive oil, grapeseed oil, olive oil, grapeseed oil, and vegetable oil. I took five spectra from each oil type. And then I also had two unknown samples to look at. As we can see from these spectra, they look very similar to the human eye. And really you wouldn't be able to make a proper selection of what oil the unknown is just by looking at these spectrum. And this is where chemometrics is a great tool in combination with Raman spectroscopy for the identification of unknown samples. So in this case, I use hierarchical cluster analysis to provide separation in the data. The output is a dendrogram, which groups the data into clusters based on an algorithm, which in this case, I use Ward's algorithm. Simply, it can be thought of as a family tree representing the data with different levels of relatedness. Hierarchical cluster analysis works by determining the samples which are the most similar and then working the way up until there's just one cluster. So as we can see here, all six oil types group into their own cluster. And additionally, we can now identify our unknown samples. So unknown sample one can be confirmed as olive oil and unknown sample two as grapeseed oil. Now to investigate more the common real life issue that we see of adulterated extra virgin olive oil, I then made some contaminated samples. So these were a 50-50 mixture of the extra virgin olive oil and the contaminant oil, which was either olive oil or grapeseed oil. As before, HCA was then used to distinguish between the samples. Again, we can clearly see clusters of each oil type, and we can see that the grapeseed oil in the extra virgin olive oil is more similar to grapeseed oil by itself. We can also see that the extra virgin olive oil spiked with olive oil groups in with the other two olive oil types, which is exactly as logic would suggest. So not only does this show how simple it is to look at liquids using Raman spectroscopy and the great tool of Raman in combination with chemometrics, it also shows the identification power of Raman spectroscopy for an application like food science. 
I'd now like to briefly talk about surface enhanced ramen scattering. So SERS also has an endless list of applications because effectively it's just enhanced ramen scattering. So all the applications of normal ramen can be applied to SERS. Today, I wanna to talk about using SERS as a nanosensor. So a nanosensor can be created by functionalizing your nanoparticles with the molecules that cause the nanoparticles to aggregate in the presence of the desired analyte. You can use your Raman spectrum to determine the best size of nanoparticle for your application and also the aggregation time. Because the longer you aggregate your nanoparticles, the bigger Raman response you will get until a certain point. In this case, I was looking at glucose sensing. So glucose is important for the study of diabetes and for the to study the effect of foods on blood glucose levels for both healthy and diabetic people. In this example, gold nanoparticles were functionalized with MPBA. So MPBA contains the, a thiol group, which is how the nanoparticles can attach, and a boronic acid functional group, which can bind to the glucose. Here I use the 785 excitation because this suited best with the gold nanoparticles and the sample. So this shows the peak of interest that will increase or decrease with increasing or decreasing glucose concentrations. And from the peak intensity, we can create a calibration line. And this means that if we got an unknown sample, we can see what its intensity is at this peak and plot it into our calibration graph and this will tell us the concentration of the glucose sample. An extremely common field for Raman is in pharmaceuticals. So firstly, Raman is great for pharmaceuticals because of the option of doing polarized Raman that I discussed earlier, because it's very important to know your crystal structure when you're making and synthesizing a drug. It's also very useful for these active pharmaceutical ingredient evaluations. So whether you want to measure their purity or to check what the tablet looks like at the end of manufacturing, which is an example here. Here we have a white light image of a pharmaceutical tablet that is known to contain paracetamol, caffeine and aspirin. Here are three spectrum representing each constituent of the tablet. And then finally, you can take a Raman map of the surface of the tablet, and you can see these are all color coded as to where in the sample the aspirin is or the paracetamol is. So it gives you an overview of how the ingredients are distributed throughout the sample. Another great feature of Raman spectroscopy is the ability to run 3D maps when it's used as a confocal Raman microscope. So here we see a 3D Raman map of a transdermal patch that contains a pharmaceutical ingredient. We can run the Z map and we can see different spectrum and different layers. And then we can also identify these layers. So for example, in this case, we can run it through a database, which will tell us what the layers are. So we see layers that are mainly made of plastic and then a different type of plastic. And then we also can see in the middle where we would expect it, the pharmaceutical ingredient. So the final topic I'd like to briefly touch on is graphene. And Raman spectroscopy is one of the most powerful ways to characterize the electronic structure of graphene. So pristine graphene has two bands shown in the spectra. It has a G band and the 2D band. And defects in graphene cause an additional band, the D band. By comparing the G and the D band, you get a measure of quality for the graphene. And I now want to show you a map being taken on the RMS 1000 of a graphene sample. So here, we, do, we first of all have to take a white light image of the graphene surface using the external camera. And then the user selects the region to be mapped and the mapping parameters, such as the number of points, laser wavelength and exposure time. 
The RMS-1000 then acquired a series of spectra across the surface of the sample by moving the motorized stage. In the map shown, the regions that are highlighted in red represent represent high G-band intensity. So this is indicating that multi-layer graphene is predominantly present in these areas. By monitoring the intensity of different peaks, additional properties such as defect density can be mapped in a similar way. So you can create a heat map to see where this band is particularly strong, and you can move it around to see where particular bands are, and you can identify where we're seeing defects. And with that, I would just like to wish everybody who's tuned in today a happy Halloween and show you our latest Raman map on the RMS 1000 where we're getting into the spirit of Halloween. So here, this really shows off the high spatial resolution we can see on the Raman microscope. It's firstly a white light image of a little cake candy topper for decorating Halloween cupcakes. And then we move into taking the Raman spectrum. This is another example of when it's your laser choice was really important because there's an orange dye in the candy. It means that we get a high amount of fluorescence when we try and use a visible laser. So in that situation, I had to move to a 785 laser to avoid the fluorescence. And finally, I would just like to thank you all so much for your attention today and thanks for listening.